is our life. When He is our life. He is our life. Open your Bibles, please, to the Gospel according to Luke, Luke chapter. Let's let's start at the last part of chapter 22. Luke 22. 6-6, six, six. that's the verse. Ooh, don't let it scare you. Go to verse 6-6. Six, six. Luke, because this is the darkest day. This is the one where from noon to three it was dark, and this is the darkest day in human history. So let's start again. Luke 22, verse 66. When it was day, the council of elders of the people assembled, both chief priests and scribes, and they led Jesus away to their council chamber, saying, If you're the Messiah, tell us. And he said, If I tell you, you won't believe. And if I ask you a question, you won't answer. But from now on, the Son of Man will be seated at the right hand of the power of God. And they said, Are you the Son of God then? And he said, Yes, I am. And they said, What further need do we have of testimony? For we've heard it ourselves from his own mouth. And then that whole body of them, they arose and they brought him before Pilate, the governor of Rome. And they began to accuse Jesus, saying, We found this man misleading our nation and forbidding us to pay taxes to Caesar and saying that he himself is the Messiah, that is, a king. And Pilate asked Jesus, saying, Are you the king of the Jews? And he answered and said, It is as you say. And then Pilate said to the chief priests and to the multitudes, I find no guilt in this man. But they kept on insisting, insisting saying, he, he stirs up the people, teaching all over Judea, starting from Galilee, even as far as this place here in Jerusalem. Now when Pilate heard that, then he asked whether Jesus was a Galilean. And when he learned that Jesus belonged to Herod's jurisdiction, then he sent Jesus to Herod because Herod himself was also in Jerusalem right at that time. So last week we read through that portion and, and we talked about jumping to judgment. It is so easy to jump to judgment. It's hard not to. We just tend to do it. Father, forgive us. Forgive us. We don't know what we're doing. But we jump to judgment anyway. But for justice... Just, judgment is just a jump away. You make a conclusion, boom, settled, managed. I know, you don't. Father, forgive them, they don't know. But judgment is always just a jump away. Justice is a journey. Jesus leads the way, one step at a time. We can follow him, one soul, one person, one decision at a time. But justice is something that we all have to learn. It's not just wave the magic wand. It's just as if nothing bad ever happened. That's not the Bible. You can pull some verses out and see something like that. But we went back last week to Genesis 18, where Father Abraham was learning something in his prayer, talking, actually dialoguing with Jesus, the angel of the Lord. And he was learning about justice. And there the Lord said to Abraham, that yes, all the nations of the earth will be blessed through you, but they'll only be blessed as they learn to do righteousness and to do justice. It's, it's a lesson that, God help us, and, and, and we all need to learn to do rightly, to do justice. And here in Luke 23, this is the greatest case of human injustice that has ever happened in this world. The Son of Man, the judge of all the earth is being judged by all the earth. It's, it's an amazing picture when you analyze, when you look at it closely. There's six different courts, six different court settings, six different magistrates, people who, who can pull the lever and say guilty or not. Six of them. Six, six, six. Ooh, there it is again. Who's to blame? Who's to blame for what happened? this travesty of justice. You know, just hours before this, it was months for us because we're going slowly through it, but, but just hours before this, Jesus was seated, seated with his closest friends, his 12 apostles, and they were arguing with each other over who is the greatest. Which of them is reputed to be the greatest? The fame game, who's the most famous? And they're arguing over it. Who's the best, who's the best? Well, here's a, another version of the same game. Who's the worst? Who's the worst? 
The fame game, the blame game, it's, it, it's all the same game. And it's one we've been playing throughout our whole human history. Adam and Eve played it. You know, it's, it's the woman. It's the snake. It's, it's always somebody else. I, I was brought up in a, in a wonderful family. Didn't quite know it at the time, but uh, I, 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 you know, I was the littlest one. I, I took so much for granted. And um, it was a very loving family. And, and you know, back then, the, the, the houses weren't so big. You didn't have to get so far away from one another. Sometimes the only heater you had was a, a wall furnace or something. And so I remember my three brothers and, and my loving parents and, and all six of us sitting in a little family room. But then if somebody would pass gas, I don't mean to be gross, but I'm just saying, if that would happen, and it happens, we're human. <laughs> but man, all family affection and feeling goes out the window. No, it, suddenly it's, it's, everybody is outraged. Everybody is, who's to blame, who, who? And suddenly it all, and it was always so comforting to have a scapegoat or in this case, a scape dog. It was always comforting to have a seventh soul. Seven is the perfect number. And we'd have our little dog, Penny, our little schnauzer, and everyone would just kind of look at Penny like, oh, but she's cute, and oh well. You know, it's just like, well. But it's such a natural thing. I, I was looking at a political cartoon last week, and it was in a history book. And how how fast we are to forget. You know, back, this cartoon was from back in the early 80s. And uh, at the time, the, the, the first few years of Reagan's, um, what do you call it, term of office, the economy was really, really bad. And the whole idea of supply-side economics, trickle-down economics, remember George Bush called them voodoo economics, and, the whole, and it, even today historians question you know, whether it was good or whether it was bad, but at the time there was, no, there was no reason yet to think that it was good because things kept tanking, they kept getting worse, they kept getting worse, and, and what's going to ever pull us out of this, and what did finally pull us out, and is it this new approach toward economic supply side? Is it that? At any rate, this cartoon was from back in those days, and it said, who's to blame for our current economic problems? And there's a cartoon, it's a big cartoon, and there's a cartoon of Ronald Reagan standing there with his thumb like this. And then over on the other side of him is Jimmy Carter, and his thumb's going like that. And then standing next to him is Gerald Ford, and his thumb's going like that. And then standing next to him is Richard Nixon, and he's pointing straight up because the ones before him were dead. And right up above him, up in the clouds, there's Lyndon Johnson. And Lyndon Johnson's up there, and he's got his thumb going over here to JFK. And then JFK's got his thumb going over here to Eisenhower, and, and over across, it goes across, and it starts with, with Reagan here, and it goes then up into the clouds, and it goes across through Roosevelt and, and Herbert Hoover, and you, you name them all, go all the way back to the, the guys in the funny clothes, you know, it's the, the founding fathers, all the way back to George Washington, and he's over here, and he's pointing down at Reagan. And it's just this big old circle, and it's just, it's, it, it's a great cartoon. And it's just the blame game. Who, who do you blame? You know, we all know who to take credit. As soon as something's going good, I'm the greatest. But when something's going bad, who's to blame? And, and what was ever, what was ever worse than, than what's happening here? And as far as who's to blame for what happened, you, you've got a lot of candidates. You've got three ecclesiastical, three religious courts. You've got Annas, the high priest. He's, he's the, the oldest high priest. He should be the most responsible. He, Jesus came before Annas, and then he came before his son-in-law, Caiaphas, who was also serving as a high priest. And then he came before the whole Jewish Sanhedrin, and we looked at all of that. And, and so all of these ecclesiastical courts, these three religious courts, they all jumped to judgment. They all condemned Jesus. They did it at, at night, or at least the first two did it at night, and then they bang down the gavel as soon as it was day. And as far as who's to blame, like I said, religion is always easy to blame. You can do like uh, Vladimir Lenin and say religion is the opiate of the masses and 
move on with your communism or, or again like John Lennon and say, you know, imagine, imagine no religion, imagine no countries, all the people living life in peace and, and that's just, it's easy to say, it's religion. They're, they're the ones that, that, but there is a true religion, there is pure religion. We looked at that, it's, James talks about it, it's caring for people, it's loving people, that's the, that's the real deal. And then on the, on the political side of things, there are, there are three candidates over there. The religious, you've got Annas, Caius, and the Sanhedrin. And over on the political side, the ones that we look at next. And we've already been looking at, at Pilate. You know, how, how do you picture Pilate in this whole scene? There's been movies made about it, and most of you know the story. In fact, many of us, we, we know these stories since our childhood, which might be a handicap. <laughs> You have a picture in your mind from the time you're a kid. At some point, someone says this, that needs to say, it's great, but stop thinking like a kid. It's not, it's not what you think. There's the classic story of the little kid that draws the picture of all of this scene, and he's got the three crosses there on the hillside, and, and the school teacher says, well, there's Jesus, and there's the, but up above, flying above the crosses, there's, a, there's an airplane with a, a little guy there in a black hat flying over, and, and uh, she said, I, I see the crosses, but, but who's up here in the, in the airplane? And the little kid says, that's, that's Punches, the pilot. <laughs> you know, I mean, it's a, it's a kid thought. It's like they, you keep talking about Punches, pilot, where's a pilot somewhere? He must, you know, okay. I think you guys are all past that. But sometimes there are things that get stuck in our head and we think, oh, that's the one to blame. Maybe because of the, you know, the, one of the movies, one of the Hollywood movies or more recent movies that have been made on this whole deal. But, but again, in many ways we've seen so far, and, I, and I'm summarizing some things because all four of the gospel writers take different looks at it and, and none of them throw the blame like we do. But in many ways, Pontius Pilate, the, the Roman governor, is the least blameworthy because there's at least five different ways that he tried to let Jesus off. He didn't want to do this. First of all, in, in John chapter 18, when the religious folks first brought him to Pilate, Pilate said, you take care of it. This is your jurisdiction, your deal. But they pressed on him. No, we can't. And they pushed. And, and so first, he just wanted to get it dealt with that way. Then, like we see here, he heard that, oh, this is Herod's jurisdiction. I'll send him over to Herod. And then after that, we'll see, we've seen that there's this Passover tradition that you give a free pass, you let someone go at the Passover. So he tries to do that. You know, do you want Jesus or Barabbas? He tries that route. He, he then tries a, 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 a route in which he says, I'll, I'll beat him and then release him. Give him a warning. Uh, this is not scourging. This is just beat the tar out of him, but I'll teach him a lesson. That's what you do, right? I'm going to teach you a lesson. I'll beat him and then I'll let him go. Even though I think he's not guilty, I'll do that but they wouldn't go for that. And then finally, he appealed to their conscience. Then finally, he did have him scourged, something that could, that could kill you. And then he's dressed with the crown of thorns and he's brought out just high theater, horrid theater. And he appeals to their conscience. He says, behold the man. He finally washes his hands, but that doesn't remove the guilt. Maybe Pilate's not the worst. But um, again, like Truman, President Truman, other, other good CEOs, they have a sign on their desk, the buck stops here. The, the, the crucifixion could not have happened unless Pilate signed off on it, so to speak. So yeah, he's a good candidate. Hey, let's blame him. There's no Romans around to vote for anyway. Like, let's just, let's blame him. But wait a second, we're going to read a little bit more, look a little bit more closely. What about Herod? Because we haven't dealt too much with Herod. Let's look at it one more time. It says in verse 8, Herod was very happy when he saw Jesus, which so far sounds pretty good. I'm happy to see you, Jesus. I'm glad. I've been wanting for a long time to see you. Glad to see you. But it says that he wanted to see him for a long time because he'd been hearing about him. And he was hoping to see some sort of miracle, some sort of sign performed by him. So here's a guy with a, with a lot of curiosity and interest and an open mind in that regard. Maybe there are miracles. Maybe this guy could do one. Ooh, I'd love to see it. 
but he's got curiosity without conscience. And this is the same Herod you see it back in uh, or Mark's gospel where Mark says that Herod was afraid of John the Baptist. And he knew that John the Baptist was a, was a righteous and holy man. And so Herod kept John the Baptist safe in his prison. And, and then he would go and listen to Bible studies by John the Baptist. When, when he heard him, he was perplexed. Didn't understand the stuff that John the Baptist talked about. But it says he used to enjoy listening to him. You know, you tune into that station and, oh, John the Baptist. I enjoy it. Sometimes those are the hardest people to reach. Somebody with, with curiosity but no conscience. An open mind, but a hardened heart. And, it, not, and so here's Herod, and, and Jesus is brought before him. And it says, verse 9, that he questioned him with many words, but Jesus answered him, not a word. Jesus said nothing to him. And you know, Herod's the only person that Jesus ever seemed to have called a name. I, now, I don't know if it was a name or not, but there was that time when someone said, hey, Herod wants to see you, and Jesus sent the messengers back, said, you go tell that fox that I'm going to go do these things that I'm going to do, and then I'm going to reach my climax, which was the cross. But he, he called him a fox, and actually it was a vixen. It was a female fox, and I don't know if Herod liked that very much. But again, Jesus doesn't call names in a mean way. There's probably good reason for him to call him that. But at any rate, because... Herod's the only guy, wouldn't talk to him here, called him a name there. He's a good candidate for the worst. You know, if we're looking for someone to blame, if not Pilate, we could always try Herod. He's, he's, he's Andy. It says, verse 10, the chief priests and the scribes were standing there, accusing him vehemently. And so Herod with his soldiers, after treating him with contempt, literally after treating him as though he's a big nothing, they then mocked him and dressed him in a gorgeous robe and sent him back to Pilate. So here he is asking all these questions and Jesus won't answer, wants to see a show, Jesus won't put on a show. Here's, here's Herod concluding that he's nothing. He's no threat. He's no entertainment. He's not doing what I want him to do. He's of no interest to me whatsoever. Where's the remote control? Time to change channels. <laughs> The, the Jesus channel means nothing. He's nothing. Change channels, and we'll find a little entertainment value. We'll go ahead and put this sparkling robe on him, and we'll make fun of him. We'll have fun somehow, but, but that's what he does. And, and again, be real easy to say, boy, there's the jerk. There's the one. There's somebody to blame. Let's, let's, let's make it him. Now it says that Herod and Pilate became friends with one, an one another that very day. Up to that time, they had hated each other. They had been at enmity with each other. The, the power, the pull of Jesus to bring people together, even if they're enemies at this point. And so these two come together. And then it says, verse 13, that Pilate summoned the chief priests and the rulers and the people, the people. That's the sixth player. It's not one, it's a, it's a, it's, the, the body of people, it's the people, it's the group called earlier the multitude that went along with the Sanhedrin. The Sanhedrin broke court and got up and walked over to the court of Pilate. There was a crowd, there was a multitude. There, there were these people that went along. And like I talked about it last week, surrounding any court, surrounding any place of power, whether it's a, a kingly court or whether you go down to the courthouse here, there's always a lot of people who are around who need something, who, who need to maybe pull some strings or, or get some favors, people sometimes desperately, I, I, I'm being falsely accused, or my brother or my wife or my husband is being falsely accused. And so you have people who always surround the courts and places of power, and some are lobbyists, and some are lawyers, and some are supplicants, and some are solicitors. But each of them is seeking something from the places of power and from the courts of power. And all of those people, don't, don't imagine everybody, because you're not... Not everybody could get into this little arena. But these are the ones, these, these are the people who go along. So there are, there are our sixth candidate. Annas Caiaphas, the Sanhedrin, Pilate, Herod, and now the multitude, the people. And in my humble opinion, I think it's all of us. In my opinion, we the people. We are the people. 
We're the ones. And I find freedom in that as much as I find shame in that. It's not that group. It's those hangers on. They're always around the court. You know that. No, that's, it's all of us. I think, I think it's the people's court. It's democracy. Democracy isn't the answer any more than monarchy or republic or federation or empire or whatever that we come up with. So there's, there's six players, so to speak. Three branches of religious government, Annas Caiaphas, the Sanhedrin. Three branches of civil government, federal, national, Herod, monarchy, what once was a republic, republic, monarchy, and now democracy, the people. Three branches religious, three branches civil. Six separate branches, and none of those branches bore fruit. I know, I put you to sleep, don't I? This is a profound picture. I, I think we have a wonderful constitution. I'm glad we have a separation of powers. I'm glad we've got these separate branches. All of that's great, but here in this picture, you've got both ecclesiastical and civil, and all six separate branches couldn't bear fruit. And up to this time, they couldn't come together and agree on almost anything until finally all six branches come together for one kumbaya moment and they say, crucify him. Wow. What does that say about us? What does it say about him? That's always the point. What does it say about him? I think of those six fruitless branches coming together and I think of the one, of the one in the center who said, I'm the way, the truth, the life. Nobody comes to the Father but by me. And I can't help in my mind but see that seven-branched candlestick. The seven branches, you have the three on either side, and then you have the one in the center. The one in the center, always the one that was lit first. Always the one. And here, all of these on either side coming together, crucify him, but that, that's the flame that's lit. And that's the one that lights the world still. And so they did what they did, and we do what we do, but God still does what he does. He's still the great I am. He still wins. And those who follow him will learn justice and mercy. They'll come to the Father. But that's, that's the picture. I see Jesus at the center. Yes, they're all throwing their accusations, but he still is the center. He's the light of the world. He's the lamb who takes away the sin of the world. That's so beautiful. That's so hopeful. But let's get back to our game, because we're not talking about beautiful or hopeful things. We want to play the blame game, right? Let's get back to what we often do best. We've got to find fault. We've got to find someone to nail it on. Oh, man. Well, at any rate, it says, verse 13, that Pilate summoned the chief priests and the rulers of the people and said to them, you brought this man to me as one who incites the people to rebellion, and behold, having examined him before you, I can find no guilt in this man regarding the charges that you've made against him. No, nor has Herod, for he sent him back to us, and behold, nothing deserving death has been done by him. I will therefore punish him and release him. There's that idea. I'll, I'll, I'll beat him, and then I'll let him go. Not, not a, a full scourging, just a beating. He says... We look at that and we say, well, if he's not guilty, why do it? But Roman law allowed it. Just, he said, I'll do it. I'll punish him and release him. But it says in verse 17 that he was ob obliged to release to them at that feast, at the Passover time, one prisoner. And really Luke just kind of throws it in, in, in almost in a, it's in a parentheses. Some even say Luke didn't say it. But Matthew and Mark go into detail about this. So here it fits into Luke's story that uh, there's this one that gets released at this time every year. And so verse 18, they cried out all together saying, away with this man and release for us Barabbas. For he was the one who had been thrown into prison for a certain insurrection made in the city and for killing someone. Now the, the, the Romans and, and the conservative religious folks saw him as a rabble rouser, saw him as a terrorist, saw him as a murderer. Uh, of course, the people who wanted to see an overthrow of the Roman 
rule, he's a patriot, he's a hero, he's, he's our guy. It depends on which side you're on, you see. But here's, here's another one. I said we got six candidates. Here we, we got someone, a scapegoat, a dog, someone we can say, Bar what about Barabbas? You think we can blame him? There were only two candidates for being released, two get candidates for being let go. And the fact is, everything that Jesus was accused of, falsely accused of, you go back and read it all, everything Jesus was falsely accused of, Barabbas was guilty of it. He did it all. That's the kind of guy he was. And in many ways, he would have been the kind of one to be wanted. When, when people were saying to Jesus just days before, Hosanna, Hosanna, save now. Here comes the son of David. They, many of them were looking for a Barabbas. But Barabbas was already in jail. He'd already been busted. His, his insurrection didn't work. He killed someone and <laughs> power put him away. But they see Jesus riding in and even though he's on a donkey, okay, may, maybe, maybe he's more than what he rides. Maybe he's... Maybe he can do it. He's the son of David. Hosanna, save now. And Jesus wept. He says, if, if you knew in this your day the, the things that make for peace. And he wept. But now here the Roman ruler is going to release someone because that's the custom. You, you've only got one get out of jail free card. You've only got one ticket, one free pass. And you got Barabbas and you got Jesus. There's only two candidates that you vote for in terms of who gets the freedom. If Barabbas hadn't been there, then by default, I guess we'll let Jesus go because there's no one else to blame it on. But because Barabbas is there, Barabbas, the guilty guy, goes free, and poor Jesus. So maybe Barabbas is a good candidate. If there had been no Barabbas, Jesus would have gone free. Let's blame, let's blame Barabbas. It won't help. And of course, he's, he's not to blame. But you know, a lot of, we do that. We do that. Blame the other guy. If there hadn't been two candidates, the other one was worse. Let's blame Barabbas. That's why we do what we do. It's somebody else. So, Pilate offers says, verse 20, Pilate wanting to release Jesus, he addressed them again. He kept appealing to them. And though Luke doesn't tell us, John tells us eventually had him scourged and brought him out with that crown of thorns. He wanted to release him and they kept calling out saying, crucify him. Crucify him. And that's the first time those words have come up. They're saying, crucify him. And I can't tell you what those words mean. I don't know fully, and I don't want to fully know. You know, we're going slowly through the Gospels, and, and you know, I don't know how many weeks we'll spend on that section regarding the crucifixion, but please don't think that I'm going to go into detail physically what happens there on the cross, because the Bible doesn't go into detail. And to me, it's just, my gosh. If one of my family members, if one of my kids, if someone I loved was tortured in that brutal way, you think I'd want to stand up here and talk about it? Play on your emotions? That's not what it's about. Crucifixion was foul and ugly, and I wouldn't want to see the worst person who's ever lived crucified in front of me. And I wouldn't want to know that they're being crucified because I said they should, even if it wasn't, if I didn't have the courage to have it happen in front of me. But humanity can be brutal. We have been brutal in the past. And it wasn't the Romans that invented it. You can go back down other nations and peoples before and after who did something so horrid. It wasn't just murdering the person, killing the person. But it was doing it in such a way that it was torturous and humiliating. And of course, always a sign, a warning to everyone else, don't you ever think of doing what this person did because man, this is going to happen to you next. And so here, they're crying out, crucify him. How can you do that? How can you be so hard? How can you be so brutal? 
And then Pilate said to them the third time, Why, what evil has this man done? I found in him no guilt demanding death. I will therefore punish him and release him. Again, he's, he's saying, I'll, I'll beat him and let him go at this point. But it says, They were insistent with loud voices asking that he be crucified, and their voices began to prevail, and Pilate pronounced sentence that their demand should be granted. And he released the man that they were asking for, Barabbas, who had been thrown into prison for insurrection and murder, but he delivered Jesus to their will. And, and I would say just based on that, the best candidate for the worst character is us. U.S., not United States. It's more than that. It's us. Wow. I just look back at what I underlined in my Bible. I'll just read to you what I underlined in this section where Jesus says nothing. It's, there's no red words here, but I underlined some black ones. And starting with verse 13, let me just read to you. It says, and the people, all together, they were insistent, their voices, their demand, he delivered Jesus to their will. Want to hear it again? The people, all together, they were insistent. Their voices, their demand, delivered to their will. Father, thy kingdom come, thy will be done. Thy will. Feed us, forgive us, forgive us, deliver us. We've all got a problem. From Papa Adam and Mama Eve all the way down. And even in the most loving and best of families, how quick we are to have our fallings out and how quick we are to play the fame game and the blame game and all the other things that we tend to do. But we have Jesus. We have the Son of Man. He's not ashamed to call us family. You know, Woodrow Wilson... I remember him well. Very idealistic man. Intelligent man. Christian man in his own opinion. We might not say he's not a real Christian. He's a Presbyterian. But <laughs> he was one of the most devout Christians, at least in his own opinion. And I don't know if he had a humble opinion. His opinion was like messianic toward the world. And it wasn't a bad opinion. And there was a lot of hope after the end of World War I, a lot of hope that maybe something good will be salvaged out of this and, and out of what, one of the ugliest, most horrid, brutal wars, the First World War. He, he said, this is so we'll make the world safe for democracy. But when he was saying that, we're going to make the world safe for democracy, other people who knew human nature were saying, and who's going to make democracy safe for the world? How can we tame the people? How can we tame the mobs and the crowds? Because we're the crazies. Not the world's safe for democracy. How can democracy ever be a safe thing for the world? And of course the answer to that question is Jesus. Jesus can make democracy safe for the world. One person at a time. One soul at a time. One decision. One step at a time. And as each of us learn justice and righteousness and take that journey and find out how often we're wrong, and find out how often others are wrong and we love them anyway, as we move forward, that, that's, that's the hope. We can always find lots of folks to blame. In fact, you know, I was, I was thinking about it and, and I've actually got an, ex, an extra two, three minutes, which is really almost doesn't happen. But I'm thinking of the clouds and the cartoon and, and you know, Herbert Hoover, I remember him well, too. Herbert Hoover, remember, remember Archie Bunker? He was the 27th president of the, no. Archie Bunker, you know. <laughs> Mr. We could use a man like Herbert Hoover again. Herbert Hoover was a marvelous man in many, many ways. If you don't believe that, go to Belgium. Talk to the people there. See the statues there. After World War I, he, 
he personally took on and used his administrative skills to save a nation from starvation because the Belgians just keep getting run over. <laughs> Germans just have a nasty habit of run over the Belgians, we gotta get to the French. <laughs> Poor Belgium was, was smashed. And Herbert Hoover was a, a marvelous man and the Belgians, celebrate, at least the people who remember, of course, generations, think, people, people forget. But he's a hero over there. But then because the economy, tanked because of the whole Wall Street thing and the Great Depression. Herbert Hoover, there's a lot of folks that would have strung him up. All those shanty towns, they were, they were uh, Hoovervilles, they were Hoover towns, they were, it's all his fault. Doesn't matter who you are, it's the other guy. And probably the greatest thing that FDR had going for him when he got elected is he's a man of great optimism, he's a man who could do those fireside chats, Fortunately, we got into a world war. <laughs> That's a joke. But in many ways, it, it might have been the war of all horrible things that got us out of the Depression more than anything else, but that's just the way the world works. And so, you know, only Archie Bunker celebrates Herbert Hoover, you know. <laughs> For many good reasons, a lot of us celebrate Franklin Roosevelt. But it's just like, it's, again, that's politics and religions is a whole lot similar. Who the, who the real preacher heroes are, God knows. But back to the fame game, blame game, back to the whole thing that I'm talking about here. The most important question is, who does Jesus blame? Because it happened to him. Who does Jesus blame? And I'll tell you, Luke is the only one who tells us this. You wouldn't find these red words anywhere else in the Bible. Thank God for Luke. It says there in verse 33 that when they came to the place called the skull, there they crucified him and the criminals, one on the right and the other on the left. And Jesus was saying, not just once, he was saying it. Father, forgive them for they don't know what they're doing. Game over. Amen? Heavenly Father, Thy will be done. Deliver us from evil. Forgive us for what we've done. Feed us and help us to feed one another. Thank you, Jesus, that you're not ashamed to call us family. Because a lot of times, Lord, I'm ashamed. But Lord, we look to you and we have hope. <laughs> we look to you and we are radiant. For the joy set before you, you endured the cross. You despised the shame. Amen. Let's close with a couple of songs. Though the youths grow weary and tired and run to it. Though the vigorous young men stumble and fall. If we wait for the Lord, He will fill us with new strength. If we wait for the Lord, He will answer our call.
though the vigorous young men stumble and fall, though the vigorous young men stumble, if we wait for the Lord, He will fill us with new strength. If we wait for the Lord, He will fill us. If we wait for the Lord, He will answer our call. If we wait for the Lord, He will answer. We shall man up with wings like eagles. We shall run. He is our life.